<laughs> so so I, I guess I'm I'm just I'm the world's biggest fan of flashbacks, and it's not like it's a you know huge flashback; it's a couple months. But I just thought you did it so uh, skillfully, where you kind of just you know give us little grains, like looking back in that t- time between January and June, right? Right. So I kind of wonder about like maybe even like the process of writing it. Did you did you write it chronologically as we read it? Or did you write some of those like mini flashback scenes like, you know, throughout? How, how did that work? I did not write it chronologically um, because I didn't know where I was going with it at first. Yeah. I, I didn't have the actually daddy's death didn't I didn't write that for a while. Um, for a while, I was just it, it was just KB being with her grandfather for a summer. There wasn't this kind of big thing that had happened. And I realized that there was really nothing at stake. Um, Mm. The way that I had written it, it was, you know, just a story of a a girl over the summer, which was, which it still ends up being. But I think by putting daddy's death at the start of it, there's so much more that's going on. And and we we come to realize how deep everything is, you know, because we're watching all of these characters navigate trauma and grief um, in the midst of all the other things that we see them doing. So, yeah, so I didn't write it chronologically. I was kind of just figuring it out as I went. Um, and a lot of the flashbacks were me coming in in revision and saying, what's missing? Like, what context do we not have that would make this feel more compelling? Or, you know, mm-hmm. and one of the things I really wanted to focus a lot on was giving characterization to daddy's character because it was really important to me to show him as a you know a a flawed character but a good character Uh, a person who you know loved his family loved his wife loved his children and ended up on a really bad path and wasn't able to get off of that path in time Hmm. because that's the experience, right? I don't think, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in a family where I had family members who struggled with addiction, where I had family members who, um, you know, I guess like, you know, dealt with, you know, the kinds of issues that we usually don't talk about, that we kind of sweep under the rug and, and no one's going to say anything about it. Um, but the thing that was interesting for me as a kid was like, these are just my family members, right? Mm-hmm. So, even if I found out that someone was in trouble, they had done something bad or they were addicted or they were struggling with what, whatever it was. I still knew them as the person who, you know, played, taught me to play cards or who, um, you know, gave me money to go to the store and get candy when I wanted to and all of these things. So I just, I wanted to show all of that. I wanted to show daddy as a, a character who, uh, was both things at the same time, you know, and um, especially with him being a, a, you know, black male character, I felt like it was really important for me to show that dynamic, um, rather than just painting him out to be a bad guy, right? Um, because he wasn't, you know, and so I think a lot of my flash, my flashbacks were working on that building that characterization. You know, there's a thing that I show that I tell my students in class often in creative writing classes. I'll say, you have to show us what these characters were like before this, before the start of the story, before, you know, especially if you have a story where things are just all bad. Mm -hmm. um, If you never show me what the characters look like when things are okay, I don't know the, I don't know the difference. Right. So I might not recognize them as being in a state of turmoil because I don't know them. I've only met them in this state. Mm-hmm. So show me what they're like when they're good too. Yeah. So I can get a sense of like, oh, things are bad now because look at these dynamics, these shifts um, in the characters and the ways that they're relating with each other. So that's what I wanted to do is, mm. is show what KB and her family were like before all of this. And, you know, that gives you also, so then you're able to see the relationship between KB and Nia, right? And you're able to see what that looked like before this. You're able to see mama because she is mostly in the book through flashbacks as well. Even though she's still mm-hmm. alive, she's not present physically. Right. So a lot of her characterization also happens through those flashbacks. So yeah. it was really important for me to, to paint a, a a deep picture of the family. And a lot of that had to come through those flashbacks. Yeah, that makes so much sense. You're talking about how you, what you teach to your students. Like there's something about, I mean, that comes automatically, right? With flashback, you get juxtaposition. You get right. the before and the after. 
And yeah, and, and then the special resonance with with KB being, you know, 11, 10, 11 years old. But in seeing these things and knowing part of them and you as a reader really fill in the rest, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it really made me think too about uh, talking about with, the, with daddy and his his drug issues, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, you know like the opo- opioid crisis and, and all of that and right. how there are some really good advances and like, hey, this is a disease, this is, you know, and treating people yeah. like people. And I know a lot of people have said, hey, where was that in the 80s? Where was that with crack? Where was that with, you know, yeah. a lot of, you know, and it, that made me think of that where, you know, like you said, he's not a bad person. Right. He has a problem. He has an issue. Yep. Um, and you, you talk about those great moments, the 4th of July when they were together and just, you mm-hmm. know, the smorgasbord of food and, and some really good times. Um, yeah. Again, you know, the 11 year old, there's so much about the world as a whole that she talks about. So she makes kind of makes friends with with Charlotte and Bobby across the street, mm-hmm. these white these white kids, right? And at first it's kind of she's just like, hey, I, I want to make a friend, and she's like, hey, and they're like, hey, who are you? Kind of, you know, without without yeah. the words, <laughs> they have fun. They they exchange rocks. Yeah. They talk about books, and the the shadow in the background is the mother who yeah. doesn't say it at first, but she's basically like, hey, don't don't play with them. Yeah, and. KB is worldly enough to say, mm, I wonder why the, when, when the grandfather, when granddaddy kind of exp- basically explains racism to her, mm-hmm. I mean, that's obviously so touching. It's like, damn it. Like the world has caught up to her. You know what I mean? Like yeah. she's got to learn about all the ugliness of the world. Right. That, that fleeting friendship. Right. And later on, um, you know, when the friendship continues amongst the kids and as usual, the adults mess it up. Um, and the mother basically, you know, without saying racial slurs, she basically, you know, she's racist right. saying, you know, oh, and, you know, they found out little things about the the family. Oh, yeah, your dad. Oh, he's not with you. OK, ha, ha, you know, all this stuff. Right. When he when the granddaddy goes across the street, she's falsely accused of stealing the bike of Charlotte, the girl. When the granddaddy goes across the street and he's so mellow and relaxed and tranquil. But that that was one of the hardest hitting for me. Mm-hmm. was like how can a person be that calm yeah he, he says on the effect of like you know we don't have to be like the past generations right i wonder if you felt him granddaddy as granddaddy or is he kind of like also like a stand-in for like civil rights movement folks and mm. you know what i mean yeah you know i don't I- I wasn't i wasn't thinking about that when i wrote it but reading back over it i do get that feeling from, you know, reading his scenes. I think, you know, the scene where he's kind of talking to KB about things that he experienced when he was a child, that scene is, was really important to me because, you know, first of all, I wanted to show that uh, for, you know, for, for black kids, uh, those conversations are happening that young. If they're not happening that young, you're going to find it out in the world. Hmm. by yourself you know um I unfortunately found out from the world before I found out from my parents about Hmm. racism and it confused it confused me it scared me it made me so sad um and so KB gets to kind of have a, a bit of a conversation before that kind of rude introduction but she's not buying it right she's listening to granddaddy talk and she's like this is not how the world is you know the world's not like this anymore these are my friends. You don't have to worry about any of the things that you're talking about. And I think that that is, that easily translates to right now, right? Where we kind of convince ourselves that we live in this society, you know, people throw around terms like post-racial or, you know, all of these different things. Um, but for some people, it won't ever be, right? We can, we can ban books. We can take content out of schools. But the lived reality is going to always be the lived reality. And that's just, you know, that's just what it is. So uh, that scene was really important for me to write, to give KB kind of this introduction, to also show how she feels like this doesn't apply to me. Um, And then she kind of goes out into the world and she's like, let me show you. Like, these are my friends and I'm going to be friends with them now. And for a little while she does. Charlotte is probably one of the people she's closest to in the novel in the sense that Charlotte's the first person she tells everything about kind of what happened with daddy. Um, she's never talked to, she hasn't even talked to her mom and Nia about it so much, you know, because they've been very standoffish. So Charlotte does give her that opportunity to, you know, feel heard. 
unfortunately, Charlotte is very young and impressionable. And so towards the end of the novel, she's not able to have KB's back. But, you know, I wanted to show that, again, they're not they're not bad kids. You know, that there's they're very important to KB in her journey. They're, you know, probably the best friends that she has in this um, environment. Um, and at the end, you know, I do offer, you know, a little bit of an option for, little, for Bobby little, and Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to have an opportunity to to be different, just like Granddaddy described, you know. So I, I think I wanted Granddaddy to be very calm in that scene because I, I wanted to show that he's seen this over and over and over again. And, you know, for him, it's it's nothing new. It's no different than him being a little kid, you know, trying to get the candy from the candy store with his friends. It's it's just replaying and he's doing his best to soften it for KB to, to you know, find a way that it could be different for her because that's what he's, he's, he's hopeful, you know, that it could be different for her. So um, yeah, it was, uh, it was complicated to write. Um, that, that whole thing was complicated to write, but um, I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out because I think that it says a lot about a, a few different things. I, I wonder if I can, if I can ask, like you're talking about like being confused when the world mm -hmm. taught you, was it like a confusion? Like, you know, like speaking about Zora Neale Hurston, she has that great piece where she's, she writes about just kind of like me. How could you hate me? Yeah. Like, I'm so freaking cool. Yeah. Was it kind of like that? Not not to say you're conceited. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like, <laughs> was it just kind of like what, why why me? Was was that the confusion or was it a lot of things? It was. It was a lot of that. I was. You know, I, I won't go fully into it, but I was a young child walking to school, and some adult people yelled something out to me, and my first reaction was like looking around. Like, well, they couldn't possibly be talking to me because one, I'm a kid. Two, you're adults. Three, I don't know you. Four, I'm not even sure exactly what the word means. There were so many things that were going through my mind because I was I was very young. Um, but yeah, it was this confusion of just like, what are they saying and why would they say it to me? You know, I wasn't doing anything. I was a little kid with a backpack on walking to school, you know? So um, yeah, I think it is that it, it's just... You know, it's that moment where you realize that there are things about me, my identity, who I am, that could cause someone to hate me without knowing me at all. Um, and that's a really hard pill to swallow. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you know, Nia and KB, I mean, they're bickering like any sisters would. But, it, you know, the, with, with all that they've gone through, the, the intensity definitely ratchets up. And, you know, there's, I hate you. And they're throwing, you know, words at each yeah. other, some really hateful words. Nia's, Nia seemingly is, she's into boys and nothing else. She, you know, her sister's annoying to her. There's, Nia's what, like, like 15? 14. Yeah, she turns 14 15. To, okay, so uh -huh. 14, 10, 15, and 11 throughout. They yeah. both have their birthdays during that summer. And it's just kind of like, you know, she isn't that, that 11 year old age you know she's not yet into boys she, you know it's that it's yeah. the tweens. so it's you know i think it's even more yeah. awkward than the 15 16 year old years right <laughs> yeah right and so um but you were talking about earlier how like in a, in a positive way how kb like is like the one who brings them all together but right. she's also burdened right she's also burdened by yeah. hearing these stories she knows more about all of the stories involved including granddaddy and, and, and mom's you know relationship and history um so I wonder just about like the pressure on KB as the daughter that maybe Nia didn't necessarily feel. You know, they're having two very different experiences. And somebody asked me a couple days ago if I would ever write a, a, a sequel to this book from Nia's perspective. Mm. And that was like a really interesting question to me. People have asked me before if I would ever write about KB again. And I've usually said... Probably not. You know, I wouldn't say never, but I felt like I was done writing her story. I did actually try to write an older KB at some point. And I just, I don't know, I couldn't find the voice and make it, I, I it just didn't feel right. Um, so I kind of felt like, I think I'm done telling her story. But the question about Nia was an interesting one. I think I, a lot of times wondered how the story would look different if I had told it from Nia's perspective, you know, because anytime you're writing a story, you're choosing whose perspective to, 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 you know, focus on. And it would have been a completely different story from Mia's yeah. perspective. And even though she was, she, her circumstances were very similar to KB's, but it would have been a very different story, you know, but the thing is, is 
Nia is grieving just like KB is. Um, and Nia has another trauma that KB doesn't even know about, right? That has to do, you know, that's uh, in, in terms of her relationship with daddy. Mm -hmm. And so Nia is in this complicated situation where unlike KB, because KB just loved her daddy and thought he was a wonderful dad. Nia had more complicated feelings about her dad um, because of the things that happened between them because she was older. And so for her, she's grieving and she's sad, but she's also dealing with these really complicated feelings, um, you know, that I think a lot of us can relate to if you, you know, ever lost someone who you had a complicated relationship with. Um, so, you know, I think the interesting thing is KB and Mia were super close and probably still could be, but they're each trying to navigate something and what KB figures out is we have to actually share with each other. We have to talk to each other. We have to, you know, the way that we can get through this is together by talking about it, by listening to each other, by letting each other cry. And it's when they kind of have those moments that they're both able to, to start to move forward. Um, but yeah, you know, KB and Nia are like any other siblings. You know, I have an older sister. She's not as older then, you know, me and her only have a less than two year age gap. So we're not KB and Mia, but, you know, it's it's easy to write a sibling story if you have a sibling, you know, all yeah. of us kind of know those dynamics and can get them down on the page. I think what was interesting about getting their story down on the page or their dynamic down on the page was trying to think about how the trauma and the grief was affecting each of them in different ways. You know, we see KB start up this counting habit and, her focus is a lot on control. KB is trying to control everybody and everything around her. She's trying to fix her family. She's trying to, you know, get them back home, get them all together. That's where her trauma and grief, that's what's helping her function. Nia is withdrawing. Nia is feeling the need to distance herself from members of her family to strike out on her own. And, you know, I think in that way, she is trying to just uh, not feel. Um, she's trying to go be a regular kid and hang out with friends and hang out with boys and get her mind off of what's going on at home. But they're both doing the same thing. They're both right. coping. They're trying to find ways to cope and it looks different. And, you know, it kind of takes them till the end to realize like, we're both doing this. We're both trying to figure this out. And it would probably go so much better if we weren't actively harming each other while we were trying to do it, which, you know, I could talk on and on about trauma and the ways and, and grief and the ways that we navigate it because that was another thing I really wanted to put in the novel because, you know, grief is really fascinating and it hits all of us differently. And I think in this one novel, you see every character dealing with it differently. No two characters experience it the same because even mama, right, has a completely different response to the trauma and the grief, which is what propels her to take her kids to her, her dad's house in the first place. So. You know, I think I just wanted to explore that a bit through the, the dynamics of those relationships. So, I mean, we should understand that Mama was like at a, like, what do you call it, like inpatient facility? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't ever put it, I mean, yeah, there are there are hits throughout and KB does ask some questions. You know, this is one of those books where we know as much as KB knows. So if she doesn't know it, it it's not true, right? So that was one of the things I struggled with because in earlier versions of the book, KB had no idea where her mom was and I didn't put it on the page. And so it was just like a huge mystery. And a lot of people were struggling to feel compassion towards mama's character because they were like, how would she just abandon her kids? Yeah. And I knew that I was trying to write something. I, you know, I write a lot about mental health, both through my fiction and like, you know, you know, just essays. And um, anytime I can talk about mental health, I do. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to show Honestly, I felt like I wanted to show something that felt very radical because I don't know if, I, if this would even happen at this time, right? That this Black woman would have lost her husband and would have prioritized herself in this way. That she would have said, you know what? My mental health is suffering. I need to have a break. I need to take my kids somewhere safe and then I need to go take care of myself. That's radical, right? Especially yeah. in the Black community, things like therapy and mental health awareness are taboo. Um, you know, especially at that point in the 90s. So, you know, I wrote it, even though I was like, yeah, it probably wouldn't have happened like this at this time, but I wanted to show it. 
I wanted to show, I wanted to show granddaddy, a member of the older generation, having to look at what his daughter did and try to understand it and try to find compassion for her, um, which is again, radical um, for yeah. the, for this community and for, you know, this time period. But I wanted to show it because I think it's important to show a woman make that kind of a decision. Yeah. Um, so. Hey, the nineties went that long ago. Okay. Don't talk about them like they were like centuries. <laughs> Listen, is I don't know. It's feeling longer and longer it ago. Is. The older it I, is. the longer I stay on this planet. So. Oh my God, it really is. <laughs> No, no, you're right. I mean, what a what a difference. I'm trying I'm just thinking of like the difference where if in that earlier draft you're talking about where if mama were just away, yeah. Yep. You, you couldn't help but think, man, yeah, how could she be, you know, how could she be leaving them at this time? It's a different like story, said, yeah. Yeah. Radical and like and you hear in the phone calls, like she's she's going through things, obviously. And she's conflicted yeah. and she's ambivalent and you, you feel for her because yeah, she why wouldn't she be incredibly affected like all of them? Like you said, very radical. Right. Way yeah. back in the day in 1995. Back in the, back in the day, back in decades, our day. Decades ago. Actually, there's multiple <laughs> decades. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So you, you you have some great scenes um, that really sum up, like, the the split in this with the sisters, like, the the birth, their various birthdays, mm -hmm. um, the barbecue, like, the family barbecue for the 4th of July, you know, they're starting to get stories about their family from other people. Um, so they're not as subjective. Well, they're always subjective, but they're getting more stories. And so they're getting a better right. idea. Um, you know, and and unfortunately, KB gets to know Rondell, who is not good for her. Right. Seems like he is. Seems like they share things in common. I mean, is he is he like 17 when he says he's like 11? Like, he's definitely older than he says, right? He's older than he says. I don't think I ever gave his age but kb started to pick up on clues she mm -hmm. started to realize that he was in high school yeah. um which was the, the first way that she knew something was was off um but yeah rondell is um has the capacity to be a good friend to kb and i wanted to show him as another character who is flawed you know i don't give a ton of backstory on rondell but there is some backstory there and um, you know, he has been hurt as a child and he unfortunately makes the decision to hurt KB, um, which was one of the most more difficult scenes for me to write. But, you know, um, one in one in four black women will have experienced sexual assault by the time they're 18, I believe is the statistic. Um you know, so putting it in the book was also me recognizing the Black girlhood experience. And, you know, unfortunately, this this is something that happens. And, uh, you know, I think I wanted to also show KB beginning to heal, you know, because I think so much of this book is about cycles, is about growing, is about you know, finding your way through the the muck. And, you know, she's already been kind of on this, this healing journey. But interestingly, for her character, I think that this moment of healing actually is like her biggest moment of healing. Um, mm. You know, I don't think she's very aware of the fact that she's grieving the loss of her father, that she's dealing with the trauma from finding his body. I don't think that she's super aware of that. But I think what happens with Rondell, she is extremely aware of. Yeah. And so I think in some ways in the process of healing from that, she's healing from all of it. Yeah. Um, so I think it, I think it served a, a, a variety of functions in the novel, but um, you know, it was very hard. I, I had a, a notebook where I was writing, you know, different things as I was revising. And there's a whole page where I was just like, how, what if Rondell is just good? What if he's just good? Like, can I make him good? Can I, you know, just have him be a good person in her life? And I, I, I try, I, you know, I went back and forth on it for so long. Um, but then at some point I read the version of the story where, where, where the, you know, scene happens as it is in the book now. And I felt it like I had read it, but when I read it, I had written it, but when I read it for the first time as a reader and, you know, when I'm revising, I try to do things to step away from my role as a writer. So I don't read things on my laptop if I wrote them on my laptop. So I'll mm -hmm. print it out and I'll read it that way, or um, I'll put it uh, on my Kindle or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, so I can experience it in a different way. And when I did that and I read it as a reader, it 
it yeah. hit me. Yeah. It hit. And so then I was like, okay, I think this is a part of KB's story, mm. um, which like you said in the beginning, it's really hard because she's so sweet. Um, and I just didn't want anything bad to ever happen to her. Yeah. But, you know, she's also strong. So. Right. Well, so the title comes from like, you know, with the idea of the, catching the fireflies, I mean, maybe the first like even connection she had with her granddaddy, you know, yeah. when he showed her how to do it. He, you know, he, he showed, he showed her how to do it. He did it. He did it with her and, you know, Lansing, which is much more, she talks about how she, she likes the quiet more, mm -hmm. more nature -y, you know, than, than Detroit. And, you know, her relationship with the, with the grandfather, he, he's a very, he very much a, you know, a God fearing man. He has his church. He seems yeah. to be one of those Christians who does live it out. He's not just all talk. Yeah. Um, and he truly feels bad about, um, about the ways that he, he did wrong his daughter. Yeah. Right. Um, she, you know, like, like she had her plans. She wanted to do things. And he, he was also sing. he was also a single father. He lost his wife right. and he just felt like, you know, he didn't want to lose her to the world. And he acted in a way that he's embarrassed about to say the least. And that really, you know, strained their relationship. Yeah. As, as Nia and and um, KB continue to to bicker and have their issues, you know they do they're they're suffering together. And like you talked about, they they learn about hey, we need to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Granddaddy has some great advice. He's not a man of many words. Um, yeah, but just he he talks to to Kenyatta and he's just like hey, he calls her Kenyatta. It's mm -hmm. good to talk about the people that's gone, Kenyatta. It's you know it's good to talk about them. We need to talk about them. Yeah, and like you said earlier. KB is definitely more forthcoming than her sister. Right. But like a lot of it is focusing on the negative. And, and Granny is like, hey, there were some you know great times too. And like, we got to talk about these people to others. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, there's more of a like, hey, we're on the same team, Nia right. and, and, and KB. And without getting into the end, um, you know, without giving away the ending, they hatch a plan mm -hmm. that kind of sort of goes to plan. Kind of. <laughs> kind of, right? sort of, right? Right. But I just, I'm just so impressed about how you brought everything together, how, again, it's written from a young point of view, who's an innocent, sweet person, but it's not cheesy. It's not Mickey Mousey. It's not, you know, yeah. Um, what's the word? Saccharine sweet. You know what I mean? But so touching, so emotional. I was saying uh, jokingly, but seriously, like, you know, the allergies got to me a bit. <laughs> Uh, for sure. You're talking about not crying at books. Did you cry at your own book? If I may ask, that's a personal question. Oh, um, you know what? I'm trying to remember. I don't think I cried there. You know, I don't know. There was this moment where I read the ending and I finally like knew I had the ending. Yeah. And that moment was super emotional for me. The ending was really hard to write mm. um, because I am not a fan of happy endings. <laughs> and um so I was just like trying to figure out what I wanted to do because I had some other endings that were really sad okay and I was like okay maybe I can find a, a middle ground um but yeah you know I don't know I just like to be realistic and yeah. you know like not always gonna give you happy endings but I think that there there was at least a hopeful ending uh, which yeah. I felt really good about and when I got to it and I read it I, I was definitely overwhelmed with emotions at, at just what had what had happened for these characters. You know, it's like they live inside your mind for so long. And then at some point you're like, the end. That's the end of your story. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the, one of the the, the most uh, one of the comments I can pay you would definitely be like, it's not even an ending. And I mean, that as a compliment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's OK, there's a potential. It's not like, oh, yep. everything's wrapped up. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. You know, because that's yep. like you said, that's not realistic. Yeah. It's there's potential, there's hope. Um, you know, it's not a Disney ending. It's not right off the <laughs> sunset type of thing. Right. I wonder what it's um, what it's been like for for you talked about some of the feedback, but like some of the, some of the feedback you've gotten, um, especially from like I don't know, you know, letters or emails, maybe even from yeah. like high, high school students and then or younger people, and then also just like what it's like to like have people talk about your characters as if they're real people. Yeah, I mean, I give I give I've gotten mostly really positive feedback. Um, a couple people have been mad at me, I think, mm -hmm. about things um, that I chose to do or not do. And so that's been interesting. You know, I went to a book club one time and the people in the book club, they were just kind of trying to make me defend all of my choices. And oh, I was like, oh, oh. 
this is so weird, you know, like the book's a book now. So I mean, we can talk about why I chose to write it the way that I did, or we can just talk about what's there, you know, because ultimately I sometimes question my choices, Mm. but at the end of the day, this is the book I wrote, you know, it's funny because I told you, me and my students have just been reading Blue Is High and, you know, Toni Morrison has been, you know, very vocal about criticizing her first book. Um, the blue sky and saying, you know, I'm not really happy with it. I'm not really happy with how it turns out. I didn't really like it. And it's like, you didn't really like it. Okay, no. Tony Morrison, you know. I know. Um, but Humble I think brag. there's always that, yeah, <laughs> there's always that feeling of like, well, I could have made this decision and it would have turned out completely differently. Or I could have gotten this point, this point across in this way. You know, I think that's the beauty of of being a writer and being, for me, what I hope is at the beginning of a long writing career is that yeah. I'm going to tell a variety of stories. and you know, there are ways that I'm going to depict things in this story that are going to be different than that story. And all of them are going to have meaning. You know, every choice that I make Mm. has meaning. Maybe I could have made a different one, but let's look at the choice that I did make and figure out why it's, you know, how it's, how it's meaningful. So, you know, um, but yeah, I get overwhelmingly positive feedback. I get, um, you know, somebody sent me a letter in the mail to to Santa Clara when <laughs> they found me. Someone found me and got me this mm. this fan mail that had come from someone who wrote me a, a very beautiful letter on a day where I actually really needed to read a beautiful letter. Uh-huh. Um, and it was an older woman. And she was, you know, I think she started the letter off with, you know, wanting to tell me that she didn't have much in common with KB besides the fact that she had everything in common with KB. And that's one of the things that I get the most is people wanting to say to me, I didn't expect to relate to this character. And I did so much. Um, Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's been beautiful. So yeah. Mm. Here's my imaginary drink toasting to that, that that, that career you're talking about that long career, the beginning career. You you want to talk about any projects you got coming out? Not to put the pressure on you. Yeah. You know, we'll see what, you know, we'll see what comes out of it because I have a lot going on right now, but um, I'm, I'm working on the book that I was telling you was like the hate you give, okay. um, but it's a young adult book and I'm really excited to try and write a, a young adult book, something specifically for, you know, younger people, but also I think it would appeal to a wide range of, of readers, but um, it's set a bit in the past. It's set right at the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's kind of considering a group of young people who are, you know, they have something happen to them, but they kind of think, well, this isn't like that, right? Because I think at the beginning of the movement, things would happen and you'd kind of be like, oh, but this isn't a big deal. Like, this isn't that, right? Um, And so it's like this group of young people who are trying to navigate that while they're also just trying to navigate identity and they're trying to navigate high school and relationships and all of these things. So um, I'm working on that. That uh, book I have been working on for almost six years now. I oh, think wow. this is the sixth year I've been working on it. It was my dissertation when I was doing my PhD. Mm. So um, I'm finishing it this year, one way or the other, and you know, moving along. But I'm also working on a uh, another book project that is it, so it's it's pretty interesting because I actually don't know what it's going to be about exactly yet but it's a travel novel Mm. where my main character uh wants to be a travel writer but she knows nothing about it she's never been out of the country um but it's just a dream that she has and um she gets the opportunity to embark on that dream after some shenanigans Mm. and uh the really interesting thing about it is i shared that in common with my protagonist that i have also Mm. never been out of and so my plan is to travel with the character everywhere she goes and kind of see what book forms. Um, and so I just went on my first trip out of the country in December um, with my character. We went to Rome, Italy okay. and uh, Florence. And um, it was wonderful. I took a bunch of notes that will hopefully start to become a, a book. So yeah. that project is more something that you know, it was personal in a lot of ways. I wanted to um, embark on this journey for myself. And I think writing about it is a really cool way to get myself to do it, to get out there and see the world. So we'll see where it goes. Rome, Cacio e Pepe, is that the big, did you have Cacio e Pepe? I did. Well, you know what? I did accept, I got like an upgraded version of it because okay. at the restaurant that I was at, they were like, oh, you can have that. But also we have this other version of it that oh. has like muscle, like it was a seafood oh, version okay. of it. And I was like, oh. 
So I got that. Um, uh, it was delicious. It was one of my favorite things that I ate while I was there. Oh, I ate lots of amazing things. So it's awesome. hard to decide, but yeah, yeah, it was it was wonderful. Cool. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Um, it's just been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm always happy to talk to someone from Santa Clara. Yeah. And, um, you know, the book, like I said, is so um, it just goes any age. It, 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 you know, hits you in different ways. And I'm sure some, you know, obviously people bring so much to um, of their own experience to the book. Yeah. And it's so cool to hear the kind of things that you've, you've heard some that I'm sure you planned and some maybe you didn't. Um, yeah. just, congratulations. <laughs> it's, uh, thank you. It's a book that like, you know, the book is always better than the movie, but man, it would make a good movie. It would, it would make a good movie. You know, I was, so the, the book was recently nominated for an NAACP image award, which um, has blown my mind. Um, and thank you. Over the weekend, I was at the big nominees luncheon and meeting all of these very fancy people. And I was meeting some, you know, some movie people. And they were like, oh, we love your book. And I'm like, oh, how much do you love it? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> would you like to make it a movie? So, um, you know, that would be a dream. That would be a dream. And that's oh, the thing that we're working on making come true. But um, yeah, it's been such an amazing journey. Um, this book has done things that I didn't ever know that it would do. I, I just found out a couple of days ago that it's required reading um, for sophomores at one of the local high, uh, high schools around here. Right. And um, so it's just, it's really cool. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's getting out there and um, people are feeling moved by it and it's, mm. it's amazing. Congratulations. You know, the people who'll be listening, Thank this you. will be on the Valentine's day and after, and it's now in paperback. Yes. Uh, get it wherever you buy books. Um, it's a great read. want to wish you great luck and thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure it's been today to speak with Kai Harris for episode 166. You can now subscribe to the Chills of Will podcast on Apple. Leave a five-star review. You can also ask for it by name using Alexa and find it on Stitcher, Spotify, and on Amazon Music. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will podcast or on Twitter where I'm at Chills at Will PO1. Sign up now for the Chills at Will podcast Patreon. It can be found at patreon.com backslash Chills at Will podcast Peter Real. My last name is R-I-E-H-L. Check out the page that describes the benefits of a Patreon membership, including cool swag and bonus episodes. Thanks in advance for supporting my one-man show, my DIY podcast, and my extensive reading, research, editing, and promoting to keep this independent podcast pumping out high-quality content. The intro song for the Chills of Will podcast is Wind Down Instrumental, and the other song played on the episode is Hoops Instrumental by Matt Whitehour, and both songs are used through archesaudio.com. Please tune in for episode 167 with Mai Dervang, who is the author of Yellow Rain, winner of the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize from the Academy of American Poets, an American Book Award, and a finalist for the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry, along with Afterland, winner of the first book award from the Academy of American Poets. That episode will air on February 21st. For now, thanks again for listening, and I hope that these uncertain days bring you texts by writers with mad skills like Kai Harris, whose work, like what the fireflies knew, gives you chills at will.